welcome to everyone. Thank you all for being here. This is very exciting. Um, I am excited to see all your faces. It's been many years since I've seen some of you. Um, in case you have not noticed, we are changing our hashtag this year. It is state of the word, written out. But remember to do your capitalization for people using reading, uh, no. Assistive technologies, readers, screen readers. I got it. Uh, <laughs> there is going to be a Q&A portion after this. It will be here from our live audience, but also some folks at home. Um, at home. Uh, <laughs> he's the at home portion for us right now. So if you have any questions, get them ready. If you're here, there's a microphone here that you will be able to ask your questions at. Or if you are watching at home, you can head on over to the YouTube embed of this uh, live stream and we are monitoring the chat there for questions as well. Um, that is all that I have to say. Um, and I think that's probably all that you want to hear from me anyway. And so, Tonight, giving our annual State of the Word, where we talk about everything we've done this year and everything we hope to do next year, is of course, WordPress Project co-founder, Matt Mullenweg. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> We're really here. So, uh, welcome everybody. And I've been told to ask if folks over here can just move up one row, uh, if you don't mind. We're, we're gonna try to fill out the front a bit. Uh, this is so exciting and so honestly fulfilling to be together again. Oh yeah, I guess everyone's <laughs> started a cascade. <laughs> um, for those joining us live, we are here in uh, New York City. Uh, it is, the sun is setting. We've got a few invited community members from all over the world. Thank you all for coming. We had people joined by plane, train, and automobile. <laughs> How long was the train ride? Three days, well, two and a half days. Two and a half day train ride to get here. So that is definitely the most interesting. Um, I actually am, uh, also came a, probably a two and a half day trip, but um, all the way from Antarctica. So if you, if you notice a little bit of a raccoon tan, <laughs> that was because I had very strong sunglasses and uh, I guess not strong enough sunblock. Uh, so that's me with some penguins. And uh, while there, um, I read a lot of books and learned a lot about Antarctica. And one that particularly stood out, actually a leader who's inspired me for a long time, was Ernest Shackleton. And I knew a lot about his endurance journey where ships crashed or got stuck and then they sent back, basically they, they saved every person who was on that journey. But a story I didn't know about him, which I learned about was on one of his journeys to the South Pole, um, he turned away only 97 miles away from reaching the pole. Uh, which is pretty darn close. <laughs> if you've ever tried to go, I think I flew like, if you add it all up, like almost 7,000 miles back. So to turn around to the last 97. And actually, as this was happening, as I was reading about this, I was thinking about the version 5.9 release. <laughs> <laughs> so you might know that today was the scheduled, or right around today, was the scheduled, uh, originally scheduled date for the WordPress 5.9 release. And we made a very, very unusual decision uh, for WordPress to delay the release uh, for about a month. So we're gonna release it in January. Uh, but it felt like we were so close that we decided to turn around. And, uh, but I am very, I th believe it was entirely the right decision as it was for Shackleton. He made it back alive. I think his saying was better to be a live donkey than a dead lion. <laughs> so we don't want full site editing, which is coming in 5.9 to be a dead lion. <laughs> Uh, but it was also, uh, I think, a moment for reflection because, of course, we talk about in the philosophy part of WordPress how deadlines are not arbitrary. And whenever we were making that decision, which wasn't that long ago, uh, to delay the release, um, I wasn't thinking so much about what was happening right then, the kind of month before the release, but what did we do three, four, five months before? So I think it's an excellent time to reflection for reflection, and actually some of this has started on Anne McCarthy's blog. We started talking in her comment section, uh, in public, of course, as everything happens on WordPress, about what we can learn from this, that we can start putting into effect, not just for the release coming next month, which will be fine, but for the big 6.0, which is coming next year. I've even heard some 
uh, rumblings that 2022 might be a year we aim for four releases instead of just three. But let's not get too crazy just yet. We're at the beginning of the, the state of the world, not the end. Um, <laughs> uh, we had a very, very exciting 2021. And really, it was quite fulfilling to be part of it after such, well, it's still part of a very challenging time in humanity. One of the things I want to highlight first was our eight new core committers, both the core and themes. So let's do a round of applause. <laughs> For Kelly, David, William, Isabel, Johnny, Jeff, JB, and Tanya. Um, so excited uh, that they now have ability to change the code that runs 43% of the internet. <laughs> Um, another update is we, we focused a lot this year on WordPress.org, and uh, one I'd like to highlight to start is around the new sites. And this, we do have some guest audio. We weren't able to get people from around the world all to New York, but we have some audio of that. For the past year, we've been working in the redesign of the news page in WordPress.org. The general inspiration was last year's State of the Word presentation and overall jazz aesthetics. Because the blog doesn't have much imagery, we took some time to explore shapes, typography, layout, and colors to get a successful result that expresses the playfulness of jazz. I think the last time we redesigned this might have been like WordPress 3.0. <laughs> so it's exciting to start to loop back to some things in WordPress.org. Another thing we were able to launch on WordPress.org was Openverse, which I swear we named before Facebook decided to pivot. <laughs> <laughs> Openverse is a search engine for openly licensed media. Search for an image, download, and put it on your site. Give attribution to the creator. And that's it. Ta da! <laughs> Learn more at WordPress.org Openverse. So Openverse is part of, we've started to expand how we think about our mission from just being about the code and the tools that allow people to publish to actually what they're publishing. So Openverse was originally uh, called Creative Commons Search, it was actually part of the Creative Commons nonprofit. But the sort of cost in running it, um, they decided they were going to shut it down or, or put it somewhere. And we found a home for it on WordPress.org, which I'm very, very excited about. Uh, we have over 600 million Creative Commons images licensed through it. And uh, we're going to have audio coming up at the end of January. Uh, there'll be 2 million audio clips there. And you know, applying open source to, to content is a little tricky. But the Creative Commons, of course, has a long legacy there, I think 20 years now. And so we're very, very excited to continue carrying that torch forward to create as much open content on the web as possible. The other thing we got on WordPress.org is the patent directory. The WordPress pattern directory, similar to the plugin and theme directories, is a site that features submitted patterns that anyone can copy and use. With WordPress 5.9, WordPress org members will be able to sign in and submit patterns to be added to the directory, as you can see in this flow. This is a huge opportunity for designers to contribute to the overall WordPress ecosystem without having to know how to code a plugin or a theme. If you've used patterns in WordPress lately, you know they make it easy to add unique layouts to your site quickly. Now imagine helping others create beautiful content from testimonials, headers, galleries, and more with your own submissions. Once submitted, patterns will be set to pending, and you'll be able to see all your patterns in one place. Submitted patterns can also be resized right on the page to give a better understanding of how a pattern will be displayed at different sizes. And since patterns are really just text, they can be copied to your device's clipboard, just like any other text. Just paste the pattern into any block editor to incorporate it into your site. And in case you didn't catch that, so the copy pattern button on WordPress.org, you just press that, then you go over to your Gutenberg, paste, and you get whatever was there. So this is a very, very exciting way. You know, with the first version of Gutenberg, the phase one, what we really created was all the fundamental building blocks, um, almost like uh, that you can build pretty much anything out of, much unlike uh, Legos or you know, strands of DNA. Uh, but with patterns, we now have the ability for really anyone, whether you, with no code or low code, uh, to be able to create and share complex uh, presentations of what you can do with blocks. Another thing I was really, really proud about our progress in 2021 was what we call the polyglots. Uh, if you don't know, polyglot is a word for someone who speaks a lot of languages. Uh, I speak barely one, so <laughs> these folks always impress me quite a bit. Uh, we had a 76 percent improvement in 
the language packs that are being created for plugins and core. And we're up to now 15,900 active translators. Uh, with that work, we've been able to take the number of locales that WordPress is translated to at time of release to 71. <laughs> 71, could anyone name 71 languages? <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Um, the other thing we've been able to do is, uh, for those who don't know, our translation system is actually powered by an open source project called GlotPress. Uh, and in GlotPress, we uh, we're able to add a lot of new projects, including OpenVerse, Learn WordPress, the Pattern Directory, and Patterns. So these are now all part of what we're translating. OpenVerse, which we just heard about, is translated into 17 languages already. Learn.wordpress is in 24, Patterns are in 24, and the Pattern Directory is in 25 different locales. So in our mission of democratizing publishing, of course, we're not doing it just for people who speak English. <laughs> Uh, and this presentation, everything, we're trying to translate into as many languages as possible, so it's as widely accessible as possible. And speaking of that, um, there's also been some exciting developments around diversity in WordPress. So we created this new diverse speaker program and speaker support program that have had 135 participants go through it so far in 66 cities and 16 countries around the world. Uh, this is uh, basically a program to help people who uh, might not have spoken at a work camp or at a WordPress event before. Um, basically, get some guidance on how to do so. Uh, they already have the skills and everything like that. Uh, this is, I would love to grow this number quite a bit. And if you would like to get involved in one of these trainings in the future, the URL, Josepha, is? Oh, make.wordpress.org slash community, and the Magical WordPress Twitter account, we'll put that out shortly, yes. or probably the correct answer there. Correct answer. <laughs> Some of these slides were changing until literally minutes ago. <laughs> Part of making WordPress more accessible as well is about the learning. And so last year I talked a lot about learn.wordpress.org, which is this idea, how do we teach more people uh, the power of how to uh, learn WordPress, teach them how to fish. Uh, we've had 186 uh, social learning spaces, which are basically like cohorts of people going through the different classes. We have 73 workshops and 70 different lesson plans that teachers, college professors, elementary school teachers can adopt and teach to their students. Uh, this is all available in 21 languages, and so far we have two courses that people can go through, which are like full collections of lessons and plans and things like that. Uh, this is pretty nascent as well. We've only had about 1,000 people go through, through this so far. But as the content gets better and better, as it gets iterated on, the people working on this um, you know, kind of improve it with every single iteration. So when a class goes through, they say, okay, this was easy to understand, this was harder, and of course, it all gets translated. Uh, if you are looking for a way to contribute to WordPress, by the way, hosting a workshop is a very, very easy way. Because um, it's just a few hours of time to be there with folks uh, that are attending the workshop. And Certainly, if you're listening to this, <laughs> you have more than enough knowledge to be able to share with someone new to WordPress. Uh, as this grows and develops, we're gonna make it a much more prominent part of what, what you see when you visit WordPress.org, because so many people coming there who might click the Powered by WordPress or Proudly Powered by WordPress on a site um, might be curious in learning what it is. And so I think this is actually one of our biggest opportunities to just uh, expand the knowledge of really what WordPress is and also define to a new audience what WordPress is. Uh, through these courses. We had a pretty good year for growth as well. So in the distribution of WordPress, I'm proud to announce that according to W3Techs, we now power 43% of the websites. <laughs> we also had, uh, we doubled the number of themes that were being added to the directory. Huge amount of work there from everyone who works on the moderation and theme directory. And we had the most downloads of the software ever and this isn't including updates, this is fresh downloads of the software. Uh, so pretty much by every metric, it was a bit of a, a great year, which is impressive because like many um, online services, we experienced a big COVID bump. So to actually lap everything that happened last year was pretty great. To put that 43% in perspective, it's actually 43.1%. <laughs> but we went from 39.1 to 43.1 in the past year. And this is a list of the other top five in there. So uh, the number two right now is Shopify, which went from 3.1 to 4.4. Wix is number three, which went from 1.5 to 1.9%. Squarespace went from 1.4 to 1.8%. 
And the only other open source project that's still in the top five is Joomla, which actually shrunk from 2.2% to 1.8%. In general, the CMSs are not taking market share from each other. So what we're taking market share from is what w 3 Tech calls none, which is uh, basically websites that are running a not discernible content management system, which most likely means it's custom or something that was kind of bespoke for that site. So what we've seen is a huge shift. This used to be over two thirds of sites uh, running some sort of custom CMS of the sites in the top 10 million. A huge shift of them were running to CMSs. But one thing that's concerning to me here is the top three used to be WordPress, Drupal, and Joomla, which are all great because we're all GPL. <laughs> so as those grow, it means that there's more and more open source on the web. But we've seen these three proprietary systems pass up all the other open source systems other than WordPress. Now, the good news is WordPress is still growing pretty fast. Uh, in this market share analysis, we actually grew two entire Wixes this year, <laughs> which is a new unit of measurement. <laughs> Um, and to put that in perspective, we're still 10 times larger than number two out there. But uh, this doesn't happen for free, and we shouldn't take any of this for granted. Um, there are, in the history of software, and certainly the internet, there are many uh, services that are, were once dominant that now we need museums to remember what they were. <laughs> so uh, to maintain and, in fact, accelerate this growth, which it did in 2021, uh, we really need to, one, stay humble and stay close to users and iterating the software as quickly as possible. One thing that's been in the news quite a bit uh, lately is also security. And I'm proud to say it was a good year for WordPress security. Um, we had over 30 people, of which a third of them were first time contributors, contributing security patches. Um, in our security reporting system, 71% of the reports ended up being closed as not applicable. And about 5.6 for duplicates, so this means that someone had reported them already. Uh, security is a process. Um, anyone who says they are perfectly secure is tempting fate. <laughs> but it's a process, and the investments that we put into updating WordPress, um, and basically in partnerships with the host, where we work with both host and CDNs like Cloudflare to whenever we are aware of something, we actually uh, work with them first to protect WordPress sites often at the network edge or at the host or data center edge, in addition to being able to push auto updates um, to the vast majority of WordPress sites in the world. And this is incredibly important as we go forward and continue to grow. Again, security is a process, not an endpoint. So our ability to be one of the most secure platforms in the world is 100% a result of how much we're going to be able to update sites. Uh, because humans are fallible, something I fundamentally under, uh, believe. Uh, all our code is written by humans, as far as I know. <laughs> so that means our code is fallible. So that means somewhere in the WordPress, many hundreds of thousands of lines of code, there's something that could be improved or some sort of bug, which might have a security implication. So what's really key there is not is how we're going to be able to update it. Uh, in terms of updates, changes, improvements, we also um, did a lot of the block themes. So this is last year, we only had two of these in the world. <laughs> now we're up to, or three, now we're up to 30. So we have a 10x, but this is nothing compared to what it's going to be in the future. Um, Block themes are basically themes that are built from the ground up to be uh, customizable entirely with the Gutenberg block editor. Uh, 2022, which is the new default theme, which will actually launch in 2022 <laughs> with the release of 5.9, um, uses all of our new tools, including blocks, themes.json, and the new design tools I'll talk a little bit about later and a little bit next uh, in this presentation. We also finally got to you know, one of the uh, as you know, like, there's a limited number of developers for WordPress, so we kind of work on different things at different times, which means sometimes there's parts of it that haven't had attention in a while. And if you have recently updated widgets in your sidebar, <laughs> you might have seen one of those parts. <laughs> but coming up, uh, or, or actually now, you can now manage widgets with the block editor. As which... of WordPress 5.8, you can now manage your widgets with blocks, allowing you to visually edit more parts of your site. Here's an example showing off how deep customization can go with a combination of tools, starting with layering two blocks to create a neat effect. As you can see, being able to use blocks opens up tons of new creative possibilities, from no-code mini layouts to tapping into the vast library of core and third-party blocks to create content. Keep in mind that you'll have the same controls in the post editor perfect the placement and the opacity. Go a step further and add a duotone filter to create an even more compelling experience. 
Enjoy the familiar experience of drag and drop to get the details just right before saving, checking out your awesome creation on your site. Thanks to the Query Loop block launched in 5.8, you can now easily display your posts and pages with blocks, as you can see here. This advanced block comes built in with various layouts that you can switch between until you find the one that you like. From there, you can go a step further to customize your featured images thanks to new design tools coming in 5.9. This includes dimension controls and various scale options so you can tweak to your heart's content. Again, that was like a pretty fancy demo. I'll mention a few things in there. You got to the block navigator, which is a very exciting way and accessible way to navigate through blocks. And I don't know if you saw it, but what Anne was doing in that demo when she was changing the size was actually she clicked and then moved her mouse up and down, which actually increases it. And finally, one of the things that we're still not sure how to describe exactly, but we're very excited to be part of the design tools of WordPress is Duotone. Image filters like Duotone can be used in even more places like the featured image block. It's a great way to bring character to your photos and perhaps in the future your videos. This means you can transform your images without touching any code or photo editor. If you look, I'm gonna to try to go back to the beginning of that. <laughs> she might start talking again. Um, but if you saw, those images were all kind of different colors and they didn't really match. What Duotone allows is imagine Duotone being like grayscale, but instead of just going between white and black, you get to choose the two colors that it goes between. So essentially what this can do is create a really cool, consistent aesthetic throughout all the images. And what we're having here is it's actually being used in the query block. So when Anne updates one of them, uh, to you know, kind of cross fade the highlights or shadows, which you can choose, um, it actually updates every single uh, post in that block. So that's why they all now look cool and consistent. Uh, this is a pretty cool tool. <laughs> it's hard to explain, but really fun to play with. <laughs> so if you're gonna uh, get a, one of the latest uh, block themes, including you can download the 2022 one from betas. Oh, we got a little feedback there. Um, Play with this. It is really, really cool. And another cool thing is that uh, themes can, of course, define the default gradients that are suggested through themes.json. Uh, all of this is possible because of the literally thousands of people that contribute to WordPress. So just like we did in the beginning, thinking committers, I do want to thank and highlight, at the very least, the faces, if not all the names, of some of the contributors to our last releases. So the 5.7 release was named for the amazing jazz bassist, Esperanza Spalding. And we had 481 contributors in that release, of which 24% were brand new. This is all of their faces. <laughs> 5.8 was named for the virtuosic pianist, Art Tatum. Um, one of my favorites, check out Tatum recordings. They will blow your mind. And in that, we had 530 contributors. Again, about 25% new. <laughs> uh, and this is all of them. Da, da, da. And for 5.9, yeah. <laughs> your face could be up here still. <laughs> I mean, not right now. <laughs> But for 5.9, we've already had 580 contributors to the core software. But if you watch your avatar up here uh, for the release post, uh, there's still a few weeks. <laughs> so you can test, submit patches, or otherwise contribute to WordPress 5.9. Um, and this is the folks who have already showed up. So cheers to them. Contributors show up for all sorts of reasons. It's to give back to the project that helped them, to network and socialize with like-minded people, to support and learn from entrepreneurs and other professionals, to gain valuable skills that are really, really useful, work alongside some of the best developers in the world. And if you have another reason, uh, drop us a tweet. So we're using the state of the word tag, but we're also gathering uh, lots of feedback during this, during this live stream and for whoever's watching this later. Uh, so use the state of the word. <laughs> uh, hashtag, and uh, we're gonna check that out and actually highlight some of them on the blog later. 
Um, you know, block editors and visual editors have been around for a long time. But one of the things really unique about WordPress and one of the reasons it's taken us so much work to get to where we are today with Gutenberg is we are committed to doing this in a web standards based way in a way where the code is very, very clean, which also means it's more accessible and highly performant. If you haven't yet, look up some of the benchmarks of Gutenberg versus any other page builder. Uh, it generally has much higher scores and much lighter code. Um, we are on the cusp of finally coming to 5.9. This looks like an Apple slide, right? It's kind of cool. <laughs> It's got duotone, uh, improved gallery, which you can drag and drop, block spacing with a single control, blur or bark, flexible layouts, themes and patterns. You can edit your site logo easily, including make the logo bigger, which I'm sure some designers have heard. Someone got that one. <laughs> the list view, which is super, super cool. It allows you to navigate between relatively complex hierarchies of blocks very, very easily. And finally, the integrated pattern directory, which is probably the easiest way to essentially contribute code to WordPress that has ever existed. Um, we've got a few demos here of what's in 5.9, and these are honestly some of the coolest demos we've ever shown in the state of the world. The 5.9 release marks the introduction of a next generation of themes that allows greater customization and simpler building. Themes can now be created entirely with blocks, meaning you get all the familiar editing tools and the same blocks you use when creating posts and pages to allow you to edit all parts of your site, including your header and footer. All the templates from the theme can be edited using the block editor, like the home page, your blog archive, or single pages. Want to zoom in on just your header? Easy. Using the top toolbar, select your header and switch into a dedicated mode to do exactly that. Once there, you can explore the new navigation block that comes with built-in responsive and keyboard accessible options. With over 30 theme blocks, the ability to customize and create every part of your site has never been easier. And do it in a fully responsive way as you just shop with moving from desktop to mobile views. We've now got styles. These styles are so cool. introduce a quick and intuitive way to change all the visual elements of your site globally, from typography to colors to various aspects of how blocks appear. All of this allows you to achieve distinct looks by modifying the style presets. Here's an example from the 2022 theme, showing how drastically different the theme can be with tweaks to the styling options. You can change anything, but there must always be birds. <laughs> it's called the hatchery theme. I mean, you're kind of stuck with it. <laughs> and then finally, we improved how patterns work. Patterns can be used to create different sections like headers and footers. In a few clicks, you can make a brand new header without changing your theme. Open the inserter, switch to the Patterns tab, and select Explore to see what's available. All these new features help you get where you want to go faster. Time and time again, as we look towards the future of WordPress, it's probably my favorite slide, <laughs> um, we're finally achieving one of the things that WordPress set out to do uh, 18 years ago now? <laughs> I feel a little old saying that. <laughs> uh, I think starting, well, actually now I've worked on WordPress more than half my entire life. I hope to work on the rest of my life if y'all still let me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is why we started the Gutenberg project. When we first introduced Gutenberg a few years ago, all the way to when we first showed the first mock-ups and ideas of it in 2013, we said this was going to be the foundation on what the new versions of Gutenberg was, uh, what the new versions of WordPress were built on, what our next 10 years would be. And uh, not only are we enabling folks to express themselves, and ideally uniquely on the web, unlike the cookie cutter that all the social sites try to put you into, the cookie cutter looks, um, we're doing it in a way which is standards-based, interoperable, <laughs> Uh, based on open source, increases the amount of freedom on the web, uh, which is very key, certainly to me, and the most important thing uh, that I work on. Um, as we're renewing our commitment to the open web as a whole, it's also been kind of an exciting time to just be following technology news, because a lot of people have been talking about Web3 and the decentralized web. Um, 
I'm not going to dig super deep into defining Web3, because I don't think anyone really knows what it means. <laughs> uh, but it is a buzzword that's now being talked about on NPR, Wall Street Journal. Uh, it's being talked about in the context of global st uh, standards. And to me, what Web3 embodies is two essential ideas, decentralization and individual ownership. And for me, those are both things that WordPress is both well poised to be already doing and to continue doing for some time to come. Let's talk about decentralization and ownership. Um, WordPress in specific, but open source in general, you can participate in it from anywhere. There's 30 of us here. <laughs> but the WordPress community, as we saw, is thousands and thousands of people, uh, 15,900 translators. Um, you can host a site anywhere on any infrastructure that you like. You can create your own forks of WordPress. Any person here could create uh, Penguin Press or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> uh, take the code and take it on your time. And you're really only limited uh, by your time and creativity, which is also an aspect of at least my favorite Web3 projects. The other key is individual ownership. So in WordPress, as with some of the best Web3 products, um, you own your own content, the code, everything to run it without any payment to WordPress. You can move your content from one site to another easily. In fact, WordPress's export format has become the de facto standard for all their CMSs. <laughs> so even like a Squarespace, and kudos to Squarespace for doing this, supports when you export from Squarespace, they actually export in the WXR, WXR format, which is basically just something we did like 15 years ago, which is take RSS2 and add on a few extra XML fields to create a standards-based uh, WordPress export format. And you have the four freedoms of open source and the GPL, um, which allow for ownership for every individual, including every person in this room or every person watching this owns WordPress just as much as myself or Mike Little do, and an individual, individuality of expression. Uh, keep this in mind, and I would say apply the filters of everything in Web3, the NFT space, et cetera. There's been an incredible amount of innovation I think this uh, has also attracted some hucksters <laughs> and some uh, folks kind of hustling things that aren't truly open. So you all are very familiar with WordPress. So for every project which is asking for your money, dollars, or for you to pay the cost of a house for a picture of an ape, <laughs> you should ask, does it apply the same freedoms which WordPress itself does? And how closely does it hew to and to increasing your individual agency and freedom in the world. Uh, ownership has also been a fun topic in WordPress this year, because we've had a lot of acquisitions. <laughs> <laughs> there are 42 logos and slides on this, uh, logos on this slide, which represent acquisitions I was able to track for those on the live stream, something just crashed. <laughs> we don't know what it was. Hopefully everyone's okay over there. Um, <laughs> on sites like Post Status, there's been a joke, number of days since acquisition constantly reset to zero. And um, it's been a lot of these. And I probably missed some in this logo site, so I apologize, whatever I missed. Um, so some people have been saying that there's been some sort of unusual trend in WordPress or uh, something crazy happening in our community um, so one thing I like to do in these state of the words is also put whatever we're doing in the context of what is more broadly happening in the technology and world uh, ecosystem out there. So I've got a few slides to share to you, uh, technology and macroeconomic trends. So this from Refintive is the number of uh, deals and M&A happening in just the technology space. Um, so you can see over there a big roll up. <laughs> it doesn't look like almost anything that happened before. So maybe 2000, 2001. I don't have any comments there. Um, but this is going to well over 10,000 transactions uh, in just the first nine months of 2021 alone. And if you were to broaden it to the global M&A landscape, not just technology, we've seen over 45,000 different acquisitions. Um, 
This is up over 24% from last year, which is already a huge year and represents $3.6 trillion of different mergers and acquisitions. The United States in particular is leading the pact, and the stats there show a 139% increase year over year from last year. This is driven by another trend which I found utterly shocking to learn and understand, which is uh, capital inflows to stocks, or is it the, the chart says, come and get them while they're hot. <laughs> um, I'll counter that with a Warren Buffett quote, which is to be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. <laughs> so basically what this is showing is dollars in billions of money moving from other assets into public equities. So you can see, for example, kind of 02 through 07, it's kind of plus or minus 10, 20, 30, 60 uh, million dollars go in and out of equities. We had some bumper years in 13 and 17 with um, 252 and 295 billion dollars coming into public equities. But look at why that graph. <laughs> Uh, so far, the estimate for 2021 is, let me make sure I get this correct, $1.6 trillion of capital inflows to public equity markets. So if you see valuations going crazy, <laughs> mergers and acquisitions going crazy, I believe that to, this to be the root source of what's happening in the broader uh, economic market. Um, there's obviously a source before this. <laughs> I will not uh, venture to guess what it is uh, around stimulus or governments or something like that. Um, but this also, my point here is that these trends are not unique to WordPress. So our 42 deals <laughs> is not that bad compared to what's going on in the world. Um, there's also been something that's been talked about in context of this that the larger the company, the greater the influence they are in the WordPress world. And I would like to counter that as well and invite more companies to contribute. So this is a graph for WordPress 5.6 of the contributors. Um, you can see one of the biggest bubbles on there is a company I always like to highlight and say the words, which is Yoast. Yoast is three times larger than a few others there, including some hosts like GoDaddy, WP Engine, even though it has one-fifth in the case of WP Engine, and like one-eightieth in the case of GoDaddy, number of employees. So the impact the company has on the future of WordPress is not at all related to the size of the company. Uh, what I would love this graph to look like in the future, it's more like this. <laughs> There's no reason that if we really take to heart what's made us successful so far, that we can't get more companies participating in the commons of what's happening. Uh, so when a company benefits from WordPress, when they put something back into the core, whether that's through translations, community volunteering, or core code, as this particular graph is representing, um, it kind of ensures that there's something left in the future for WordPress to, to be there. Um, you can't run Wix or Squarespace on GoDaddy, as an example. Uh, so what I really feel has gotten us here is a spirit of we, what we call um, five for the future, which some of you are all familiar with, um, but I would like to expound a little bit for those who are maybe new to hearing about this or in other communities, because when we hear about things like, you might have seen this uh, security bug that's going around with a library called Log4j. Who's ever heard of Log4j before? Two, three people before Twitter recently. Um, but it's caused this uh, very real RCE, which stands for Remote Code Exploitation Vulnerability, and basically every major internet service in the world, <laughs> for trillions of dollars of market cap from Apple to Minecraft have been impacted by this. And uh, gosh, I wish I had a slide for this, but have you seen the uh, XCK, XKCD graphic? <laughs> uh, we'll tweet it out later, or maybe now. Uh, there's this fun comic one of the coolest comics in the world, by the way, that shows like a very complicated structure, and this is like the global economy, and this one little thing holding it all up is an open source project maintained by three random people in Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of log for Jay. <laughs> uh, fortunately, we don't have this problem in WordPress because we have tons of folks sponsored, and we've been really key about Five for the Future. Um, but it turns out that the folks working on log for it is like three people making, and the person who's 
fixed the bug, said they got a sponsorship of $16,000 per year um, fixing these sorts of things. So how do we avoid this in WordPress? What have we done that's made it successful so far? And what do we need to uh, pay even more attention to in the future as more and more companies become commercially successful, as amazing businesses are top of built on top of the WordPress ecosystem, as web hosts get millions and millions of sites, customers paying millions of people paying hundreds of dollars per year running WordPress as their CMS. So what Five for the Future is, it says that basically the idea is whatever you get from WordPress, take 5% of that and try to put it back into the commons. Are you familiar with the concept of the tragedy of the commons? It's in an old economics paper from actually forever ago. So the example they used was sheep. <laughs> and the idea was if, if there were a lot of different shepherds, I guess, with sheep, and there was kind of a, a commonly owned area of grass in the countryside that didn't really belong to anyone. If all of the shepherds had their sheep eat as much of the grass as possible, or as much as the sheep wanted, um, the grass would die. And this thing which belonged to the community, the commons, would deplete because of essentially overutilization by actors acting in their own self-interest short term, but against the self-interest in the long term. Uh, some of you might think this parallels to this in climate change or other things that are happening in humanity. Um, in the digital world, at least, I think it's possible to have an abundance of the commons. So the more people that use a program like WordPress, the better it gets in so many ways. More bugs get reported, more translations happening, more, uh, more plugins get developed, more themes get developed. And so the more people that use WordPress, WordPress doesn't get any worse for any of you. In fact, the more people that use it, the better it gets. But part of that is some percentage of the people who essentially directly benefit from WordPress, uh, putting something back into the comments, uh, fertilizing the soil, <laughs> planting some more grass, however you want to think about it. Uh, have you ever seen the take a penny, leave a penny? <laughs> Little things. Do those still exist even? Do we still have pennies? I know they've been trying to get rid of them for a while. Funny story, actually. Uh, I used to participate in this macroeconomics competition because I was a really cool high schooler. <laughs> and I got to meet, at the time, the treasurer of the United States because we won the competition a few different levels. And um, I'm a high school kid, and uh, so and I apologize, the name is escaping me right now, but the treasurer of the United States, I was like, cool, you know, you're the treasurer, what's the thing you most want to do? And her answer was, get rid of the penny. <laughs> and I was amazed, so the treasurer of the United States, if you don't know, actually signs all the dollars, all the dollar bills, I mean, not literally, but if you, if you looked at a dollar in your pocket, you would see it was a, a virtual signature or a printed signature from whoever's the treasurer. But apparently pennies cost more to produce than they do to use. So it's kind of a funny thing that we still have pennies in the United States, at least. Weird aside. <laughs> uh, commons, sheep, pennies. <laughs> Did y'all know where I was going with that? <laughs> it's been a while since I talked in front of people. <laughs> Um, five for the future is we launched this in, I think, 2014, where we first started talking about this. But in reality, it's been embedded in many of the companies, including Yoast as an example and Automatic, that contributed WordPress almost from the very beginning. Because we had this sense that what we were creating together um, wasn't something that happened for free or that would happen automatically. It was a freedom that required the diligent effort of all the people that were putting in their free time and their you know, hard-earned uh, talent into this thing that we were creating together. And not unlike the Wikipedia, could become something that's far greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, WordPress cannot be written by one person or even one company. The quality, the robustness, everything of the software is a result of everyone who's contributed, it, not, contributed to it, not just in the most recent releases, which we highlighted some of those, but all the way going back to even the predecessor to WordPress, B2. <laughs> Every line of code there um, represents a little bit of someone putting a penny in that take a penny, put a penny uh, jar. 
I have studied actually in many platforms over the years, whether it's uh, open source platforms or successful uh, sort of desktop platforms like Windows. And there typically tends to be this 20 to one ratio that if the ecosystem is benefiting kind of 20 times more than whatever is in the center of the ecosystem, uh, it works. At the point one, whatever is in the center of the ecosystem takes more than that, kind of all breaks down. As two recent examples, there used to be something called a Facebook platform. Uh, the Facebook platform mostly benefited Facebook. <laughs> and when a company got too big on top of it, often Facebook would change the rules or pull the rug out under, whether that's a company like Zynga or others that were benefiting from it. Um, if you go all the way back, does anyone remember the release of Windows 95? Yes. Oh, I'm impressed. <laughs> so, for those who don't, I'll paint a picture. You know how people stand in line to get a new iPhone? They used to do that for a box of Windows, <laughs> which came in on a CD. <laughs> and you'd wait at like a Best Buy or something. And I think Rolling Stones recorded a song. The release of Windows 95 was basically like a world event that was covered by every single major media and everything. And in reading books written at the time and media, one of the funny things I found Microsoft saying was that for every dollar that Windows would make, $20 would be made in the Windows ecosystem. This ratio kept coming up over and over again in different platforms I studied. And so that's how we got to the five for the future. It's basically a one to 20 ratio, one to 19, depending on how you count it, of what is in the core versus what is happening in the community. The WordPress community is larger than ever. Uh, some estimates put it at over $10 billion per year. So how do we get to that 5% of things being put back into the core? The beautiful thing about five for the future is it can be unique. If you're an individual, that 5% put back into the core of a 40 hour work week is two hours a week. So two hours out of the 168 that you have in a week, put it back into something with core. And we'll talk about some ways you can get involved and contribute not only makes you part of defining the future of the web and the future of the open web for humanity, but gets you uh, contributing back to this thing that if you hope WordPress is still relevant, if I'm here with much grayer hair 10 or 20 years from now, <laughs> given the state of the word, hopefully a suit still, <laughs> um, it's because we all put something back into it and we all work together beyond any individual or any single company coming together to create this thing we call WordPress. And the foundations of what we're doing today also set the stage for what's going on tomorrow. It's funny because actually, you know, WordPress is 18 years old. The idea of democratizing publishing is probably 17 years old. Came on pretty early in our lifetime. Now every single startup raising money talks about democratizing. They want to democratize ice cream, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but what this means to us is the software, the core thing that makes WordPress, again, belongs just as much to you as it does to me or any other developer of WordPress. It means you can use WordPress for any purpose. It means we strive to create it available in as many languages as possible, available to people regardless of economic activity, and available um, to people with assistive needs, as accessible as possible. Um, this has been the core of what we've been trying to do with WordPress. And particularly the people in this room, the invited community members, uh, I want to thank you all for being part of that. Every single one of you is a Five for the Future contributor, so thank you. And if you're streaming, you could be in this room in the future. <laughs> Contribute. <laughs> Uh, a big part of what we've been trying to do and reinventing WordPress has been through Gutenberg. Uh, software is hard to change, and the more successful software is, the harder it is to change because there's so many built-in workflows and everything. So everything that we've been doing with Gutenberg, you know, when I got on stage a few years ago to introduce it, I said, this is going to be a backwards compatibility break meaning that a plugin written for the old editor will probably need to be updated to work with Gutenberg. Um, WordPress was <clears throat> famous for its backwards compatibility. In fact, still to this day, a theme that was written for WordPress 1.2, which was the release that introduced themes in 2005, <laughs> will still work in WordPress 5.9 <laughs> coming out in January 2022. Uh, so we're really serious about backwards compatibility. But 
Um, for Gutenberg, we said there's something new that's coming, which is going to be hashtag worth it. <laughs> hashtag state of the word. <laughs> uh, to remind you, we laid out a plan many years ago, which we were still following today, around the four phases of Gutenberg. Uh, just to remind everyone, 2018, we started the first phase of Gutenberg, which was uh, around easier editing. This was the introduction of the block editor and the idea that the block editor will be able to edit everything inside the post box. So we were thinking inside the post, inside the box with blocks. Uh, we are currently in the middle of uh, phase two of Gutenberg, which we originally started in 2019, but it's all around customization. This is thinking outside of the post box. All the things I showed you earlier that allow you to edit your entire site using this concept of blocks is uh, happening now. And what's beautiful about this is one, all the plugins and things that used to have custom interfaces, which are now being built on the Gutenberg framework, uh, inherit all the work we put into accessibility, keyboard navigation, everything that's built into Gutenberg, the clean code, et cetera. Um, also, when new users come to WordPress or new existing WordPress users are learning Gutenberg, they only have to learn things once. It used to be that the way to edit a widget <laughs> or create something you know, using a short code in a post. There were like four or five ways to essentially do the same thing inside of WordPress. And we're now consolidating this all to this one block interface. This idea that the blocks are like Lego blocks and that they can be used anywhere. Uh, with 5.9, which is coming out next month, we are, I would say, at the MVP, the minimum viable product of this customization phase of Gutenberg. Uh, so I want to remind you of the next two phases that we're heading into. The third phase of Gutenberg is going to be around collaboration. Note, I listed this start at 2023, <laughs> not next year. It's because I think we don't want to leave phase two too early because there's still so much to do. Um, I'm forgetting the number, but how many block themes were there? Was it like 38, 28? 28. That needs to be 5,000. <laughs> Like we need to really invest a lot in creating patterns and themes that take advantage of all these blocks. It's the new standard thing. If you look at what block editor, block editor plugins have been doing in kind of a balkanized proprietary way, uh, we now have a standard way to do it within WordPress. And the more we can invest into that, the more that will enable people to create really unique web presences. And then finally, which uh, we don't have a year attached to, <laughs> and in WordCamp Europe I get a really hard time for is the idea of multilingual. So we want to take everything we just talked about and essentially allow you to publish sites in multiple languages with a workflow that makes sense. Um, because you know, the world is multilingual is basically the best way to put it. So if you were thinking about how to contribute, I would love for you all to uh, get involved and join the journey of Gutenberg by talking about or contributing patterns, block themes, styles, or if you're a musician or a photographer or videographer, to take some of that work and put it into the openverse. Not the metaverse, the openverse. <laughs> which is basically this incredible commons we have of content which has the same freedoms, like the GPL, available for any of us to use, any of us to modify, remix, and refresh. We've got the very first version of the openverse now running on WordPress.org. But I really, one thing I'm very excited about is actually building that into the WordPress admin. So that when you upload a new image or video or anything like that, you'll be able to choose the Creative Commons license it. Um, maybe under our open license, like CC0, which will allow us to index it in the Openverse. Uh, or maybe under a more restrictive license. That's OK. Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> it's cool. It's all about creators having the control and autonomy to choose to license their content however possible. And for those that choose to put it into the commons, that then becomes a part of what is shared in humanity and allows us to grow and create cool things together And that kind of um, usage and remix economy. Uh, over time, I also want to build a full image directory into WordPress. And I think we missed it here, but wordpress.org slash photos. <laughs> uh, so if you want to learn more about Fire for the Future, go to wordpress.org slash five, F-I-V-E. And one thing we launched uh, also is the wordpress.org photo directory, which is an idea for a CC0, which means basically totally open imagery, which is available to be used on any sites for commercial and non-commercial uses. And we're going to be building that CC0 directory into WordPress core. So that means that regardless of what's in your media library, if you set up a, a site for someone new, um, they could you know, click on the media library, click Openverse, and say, search for 
puppies or coffee or whatever it is that they're looking for an image for and then be able to insert that just with one click in their post. And we can do that really nicely. You saw some of the Openverse attribution was still copy and paste. We're going to make that so that just happens when you insert the image. So by default, it'll have attribution for content creators. People could always remove it if they like, especially if it's a CC0 image. But I think it's kind of cool to have credit going to the photographers and people possible. So if this is something that you think would be interesting or that you have some cool content to contribute to, uh, check out the Openverse. There are so many ways to contribute. And like I talked about it, uh, it could be 40 hours uh, a week or four hours a month, you know? Anything helps. And you know, contributing money is great, but actually time is the most valuable thing in the WordPress ecosystem. It could be through design, code, contributing to the community or organizing meetups, uh, helping the learning. If you have any background in educational, uh, what's the word for that? Educational learning? Development, educational development, thank you. Um, that would be amazing for our learn.wordpress.org project. Training or documentation. Um, there's a number of ways to contribute solo or with groups. Um, companies have started to organize contributor days where the whole company might take like a Friday once a month and all get involved on the wordpress.org, make.wordpress.org, the Slack, everything. Everything that happens with WordPress happens in the open and any of you can be involved with pretty easily, which is kind of interesting, because then your code, your image, your something can show up in what uh, happens for 43% of the web. If you are listening to this live or in person, if you want to look at your phone right now, <laughs> we're very curious how WordPress has helped grow your story. And so another hashtag from the State of the Word one, if you tag that with I love WP, this is actually the tag that we're creating the new testimonial page on WordPress from. So if there's something where WordPress or the WordPress community has an influence on you, I see Topher here. I want to call out an amazing site called HeroPress as well. Is it HeroPress.com? Yeah. HeroPress.com is an amazing site which chronicles and documents people's story. In fact, if you have an amazing story as well, tweet it out, but also talk to Topher later. It could be cool to get on there. And I think once a month we highlight those on the WordPress news blog. So, what a year. <laughs> Sorry, I'm out of breath. <laughs> um, I'm also really, really excited to announce that uh, just happened our first in-person WordCamp in several years. <laughs> WordCamp Seville, or if I'm feeling lucky, Sevilla, uh, was the first in-person WordCamp after 21 months of virtual WordCamps. So they got together 101 people, 17 speakers, and that was uh, all the reports I've heard back from it. That was very, very exciting. I'm so thrilled. Uh, both to be talking to, talking to the folks who are here virtually, but also to hang out with the folks here in person afterwards, after we wrap this up. Um, but I'd love to see also more of the WordPress community. And so my one more thing for this presentation is that we've actually locked in the city for WordCamp US 2022. <laughs> and God willing, We'll be in San Diego, California. <laughs> uh, dates and more to come, but roughly around September in San Diego, California. Uh, San Diego is good all parts of the year. <laughs> it's one of those magical cities, uh, but particularly in San and September, it should be really, really nice. And I'm looking forward to seeing all the faces here again, but also everyone who's listening now or in the recording later. Uh, hopefully we can start to get together again. It's funny because uh, WordPress itself has always been massively global. Actually, my company Automatic has always been really distributed from the very beginning. We're 1,800 people now, but really from the start, we were across many different cities. So when the pandemic started, everyone came <laughs> to me and to, to Automatic being like, how do you do it? How do you do it? And it was funny because they were asking how to work together in a distributed way which we have some opinions on, we have some experience with in tools like P2, which is built on WordPress. And so we did our best to share as much as that as possible. But the secret sauce, I think of both Automatic and the broader WordPress community, has always been these times when we get together in person, these meetups, these WordCamps, these events like this. 
Uh, so uh, the fault offices default to being 95% in person and 5% you know, virtual, pre-pandemic. Uh, WordPress always did the opposite. <laughs> we were like 95% virtual. Within 5% of the year, we'd get together in person. And uh, I'm excited to get back to that because the relationships, the learning, the everything that happens when we meet each other is so, so powerful. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you to everyone who came via plane, train, and automobile <laughs> to show up here live in New York City uh, for this very special state of the word, most special to me that I think we've ever done. And uh, thank you to all tuning in the live stream. Now we have the questions and answers. If you'd like more from me, my WordPress is ma.tt. I've got a podcast on distributed work at distributed.blog. And I'm at Photomat on Tumblr, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, but now is the portion where we go to Q questions and answers.